Okay, today is uh, August 12th, 2019, and uh, we're down here at EPD Laboratories, um, Inc. in uh, West Central Nevada. And uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc. is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit corporation, and your taxes are uh, tax deductible, and everything that goes on here and all of Eric's work is supported by your donations. And if you go to ericpdollard.com, uh, there's a donation link in the main menu bar. And you can find out how to donate to the nonprofit uh, organization uh, through the mail with checks or money orders, or you can uh, donate by uh, PayPal. And all donations are definitely appreciated, and it helps to keep the uh, 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 the operation going. Um, obviously, we're looking for more funding for the seismic project and uh, telluric uh, transmission project and some other uh, uh, projects. But for now, Eric is focusing on. Uh, um, on a writing project right now which is um, kind of based on uh, Oliver Heaviside's work uh, or at least some of it and uh, this is essentially a new a new book in the making um, which is uh, most likely going to be the subject of Eric's presentation in 2020 um, so you want to kind of uh, kind of tell us what we have going on here okay so yeah I, I am I presentation entitled the I believe the history theory and practice of the electrical utility system is basically there's five or six books embedded in that so there's two basic important aspects one is what is electromagnetism because that's what we're dealing with between the wires and how do the wires affect it in a uh, a comprehensible manner because the complication is the mathematical solution for it is has never been completed so it's, it's a lot of invent as you go in this world most of the textbooks are useless unless you go back to the early ones so I decided in the presentation to okay we have to define electromagnetism so I started this chapter the electromagnetic boundary condition and these are the diagrams that are on the website. Can we see the cover of that? And so this um, this is available um, at, as a PDF. Let's get a little bit closer here. Um, if you go to ericpdollar.com and in the uh, search bar, if you type in electromagnetic boundary condition or just the word boundary, uh, you can download this as a free uh, PDF. So once you get started on something like this, it just continues to uh, to build until what you thought was going to be 15 or 20 pages is usually 250. So this has gotten that level. So kind of a bit of a background of what's going on here is I used to have a laboratory at RCA years and years ago, and I wasn't really into much of the mathematics or anything. And uh, that got taken away from me. And I was befriended by the son of Philo Taylor Farnsworth, who invented television, and was a refugee, lived in the bushes outside his house. That's how I met him. And uh, he introduced himself to me. And uh, that's its own story. That was a big change in my life, to uh, hear his story in, in relation to RCA. So, of course, I was all bummed out. I had no more equipment, and I was eating out of garbage cans and whatever. And so, Files suggested, well, if you can't use, like, tubes and capacitors, then do it all mathematically. And he gave me one of his father's original television laboratories notebooks, blank, nothing written in it, and said, now start to write about what you did in your lab at RCA. <clears throat> And that's why you know about me today, because when there was no more equipment, there was math. And that was easier to transport than substation transformers and giant vacuum tubes. It didn't require any real estate. All it required was a Toyota Corolla. <laughs> <laughs> and it has grown into this. So basically, right now, I have all kinds of parts and stuff, but I got no money to organize any of it or get facilities built or don't have any help. So what I do in those situations is, okay, I got to do something. And so 
what can we do with mathematics? So that's kind of how I got into it. And that's what I'm doing here is basically this is not like textbook stuff, which is just a rehash of what somebody said before and somebody before, or parrot talk. This is all original stuff. What I do is I go right back to the, the basic fundamentals, the primary fundamental principles, and then build out from there because most of the textbooks are useless to try to get anywhere to understand any of this stuff. So when I crash landed in Lone Pine, the objective at that point, where that's really all there was was mathematics, was to rewrite the entire book on electricity right from the beginning. And that started with, with the Lone Pine writings. So this basically is now kind of a continuation of the Lone Pine writings, and that book is a good introduction to this one, and a lot of that is redefined in, in, in this here. Do you have a copy of Lone Pine Writings here? Mm, not readily available. Okay. So Oliver Heaviside, uh, he is probably, there's no person on earth that the academia mathematician hates more in the world than Oliver Heaviside. He is probably one of the most despised people. <laughs> Which is why we like him. That's why we like him. So his idea is that mathematics, uh, he has a whole chapter on this. This book is, is definitely, if you want to learn about Heaviside, this is a good book because you get it out of his own mouth. Can we see the front cover? There, this is, there's no cover on this. So. so this is the title of the book? Yeah. So it, it's filled with loads of mathematics and, you know, exotic theory. But, uh, but then all of a sudden it'll take a break with maybe 20 or 30 pages of, um, you know, just plain talk about what's going on. And then simplified explanations. So there's one chapter here. This is the one that, this is like a very compressed version. It's hard to find stuff in here. I don't want to get the cover page. Maybe you should take a break while I get the cover page. So this is the chapter I figure would be the best one in Heaviside's book to begin this situation where we have this transmission structure. Very simple one, telephone line we were working on. But it's not so simple when you analyze it mathematically. So we want to come up with all the characters of that line for engineering purposes. So we start by developing what's called a plane electromagnetic wave. So this is like a slab of polarized ether that flies down the transmission line at something approximating the velocity of light. And it's bound to those lines. It's rigidly, not rigidly, but it slides on the lines and then propagates with the velocity. So now we're not going to get into a whole sea of Maxwell's equations and all that kind of stuff and get nowhere. We're going to deal with this on a basic level. So first we deal with in time what's going on. <clears throat> this is what's interesting. Is we have a um, let's say at this end you got the light switch and this end is the generating station. So the power flow in the line is zero back to the light switch until you turn it on. So you turn on the light switch. Well, now you've got power flow into the light, but the generating station's not seeing any load until this transient wave, this electromag plane electromagnetic wave, the thing that was shown here, gets there. And then all of a sudden the whole thing's in steady state and at that point the energy is delivered by the generator. So the question is, is when you turn on the light, where is the energy coming from that's lighting the light if it's not supplied by the generator? Well that energy has to be coming out of the electric field of the line. So now we want to find out more about this electric field so that we can figure out what the consequences are of sending this transient, let's say in the case is picking up your telephone, we want to know how many miles we can get that 
to work before this thing is petered out and they can't do its job at the other end and then the line eats up half the energy and the light bulb or the phone only gets the other end so we have to come up with the mathematical ways to calculate all that stuff so that's basically my purpose in writing this because it helps me <clears throat> so this is kind of what's inside the plane electromagnetic wave or the slab of electromagnetism so this is taking it kind of from a Max Planck approach and uh, I'm not going to get into any real heavy details with this stuff here or go on for hours I'm not that prepared for it but at any rate this chapter here reveals the whole inner workings of electromagnetism that you don't really learn in any textbook at all it's very simplified non-mathematical doesn't really require you know a lot of exotic knowledge on electrical waves or any of the stuff this is kind of the the layman's approach so this is chapter four theory of plane electromagnetic waves p-l-a-n-e action at a distance versus intermediate agency Contrast of the new with old view views about electricity. Yeah, so what he's referring to there is before the advent of Maxwell, uh, electricity was thought to have no propagation. It was, a, it was called action at a distance, and that there was no, nothing that the space in between did. But after Maxwell, that, uh, that idea didn't work out so good. So uh, one of the other problems with the original view of electricity based on potentials is it could never properly unify uh, the dielectric and, ma and magnetic forces. It could only deal with them in an isolated manner. It could never un understand the interaction. It took Maxwell to do that. Maxwell is the one that made electricity, electricity as we know it today electricity being in the Maxwellian Steinmetz type of viewpoint is not static electricity it's not what they call in physics an electric field that's a dielectric field and then there's a magnetic field and it takes the two of them in a dynamic relationship to become what engineers call electricity which is not electrostatics or uh, the electric field dielectric field or however in this case, when you say electric field, you're talking about both the dielectric and the magnetic. So all this stuff got started with Maxwell, and that's why his name survives to this day. And then he made a number of mathematical propositions on how things behave, but it was all kind of primordial. It's a lot like what I was doing here, or am doing here. You know, it's kind of experimenting, and maybe later on, you know, those dimensions didn't work. It was, it was very beginning. And then he died, and most people refused to believe the validity of his work until Heinrich Hertz came out and uh, actually got electric waves to flow through space from a transmitter to receiver, and that knocked the world silly. <coughs> and all of a sudden, everybody was on Maxwell. <coughs> now, in Heaviside's case, <coughs> the big issue here was the undersea cable going from England to the United States, I think actually Canada, and uh, a lot of effort was put in with those, uh, you know, technology they had back then. They didn't have any plastic or any of that kind of stuff we have today to get something like that to work. So they got it all together mechanically, uh, but when they connected the telegraph instruments to it, they couldn't talk more than four or five words a minute, and that kind of made the thing an economical disaster. And so, at any rate, the, uh, the experts came in and uh, made a lot of proclamations, uh, particularly a guy named William Priest, who was a government, uh, government engineer at the time, and he managed to come up with some mathematical equations that were completely backwards. So everything they were attempting to do made the situation worse. So this is where Heaviside stepped in. So, Maxwell, I think, was still alive, and Heaviside was a teenager, and he got a hold of uh, his answer, his uh, relatives were all telegraph people, and so he had the keys to you know the whole works. 
And he was so uh, inspired by Maxwell that he decided to uh, spend the rest of his life studying Maxwell's work. And he was the first one to actually make it into workable algebra that you could apply to the undersea cables. And they figured out how to set the wave straight. <clears throat> and the Lord gave us AT&T. <laughs> made AT&T rich. It gave us long distance telephone. <clears throat> and all the naysayers, all they, they just, you know, their noses just went up in the air. So that's, that's how Heaviside got into the picture. So in this book, Heaviside gives us the, uh, the layman's version of Maxwell's equations, which are going to be really useful for doing some of the development of the transmission line equations from scratch. So they're they're simple, they're directly expressible in terms of the, uh, the two-wire line that we saw the photograph of. So this is the length of one span of line, and this is the time it takes for the electromagnetic transient or a plane wave to traverse that length of line. And this is the dielectric current or displacement current flowing across the lines in this span of conductor, and this is the electrostatic potential that's associated with those lines of current generated by the potential or related to potential in the electrostatic field, so it's pretty simple. And then we can do the same thing for the, oh, I forgot to get to this. So this basically, the space factor is just a simple factor that tells you the shape of the wires and how far apart they are. And this is uh, what Heaviside referred to as an ether constant, or in engineering that's referred to the, uh, the dielectric constant or the permittivity of the space that the wires are immersed in. Yeah, so basically Heaviside calls this the first circuital equation, and this is for the displacement current. And then we have the second circuital equation for the electromotive force, it seems to be this is the part where people are having a lot of problems and Heaviside identified that but he came up with a method to keep moving forward without having to involve any of too overly complicated or useless mathematics. So where we had here the displacement current <coughs> flowing between the two wires on well, that span of wires length, uh, there's also the electromotive force that those wires generate uh, along their length, and then that equates similarly to the conduction current, the current flowing inside the wires, the actual electronic current, and then again the time that the electromagnetic wave takes to cover the distance of this span. And again we have the um, space factor of the wires and, and their size and you know, facing all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but now it appears in the numerator rather than in the, the denominator, so it works uh, opposite for magnetism. And likewise, the ether constant now is, um, is what's called the magnetic permeability. So we have the two basic Maxwellian forms of equations. This one can be directly attributed to Maxwell. This one is more attributable to Faraday, and this is Heaviside's uh, simplification of it so that it could be useful for telephone engineers and power engineers and what have you. So I take an approach that's a little different in solving these type of equations. Is uh, The big thing that everybody misses here is if you have a 60 cycle power line and you have uh, the current is at 60 cycles, of course, and the voltage is at 60 cycles, but when you measure the power, the power is not at 60 cycles. The power is at 120 cycles. And so the whole coordinate system situation is knocked off course, and this is what causes a lot of the misunderstandings in electricity. Uh, it's best to deal with things in terms of power. So if we multiply the current by the voltage, or we multiply the voltage by the current, we know that gives us power. 
So if we, in this case, let's multiply these two terms together. And so that gives us the length squared, which makes sense because everything's operating at twice the rate now. Just like the 60 cycles is 120 cycles. And then we have the, the basic volt amperes. And then the ether constants are joined. And, uh, and lo and behold, we have another electrical power on this side, the little e and the little i. But it's related to the time rather than the length of the line. And to make this fit, we have to add this constant, which is numerically and dimensionally equivalent to a established value of the speed of light. So it's really more of a numerical dimensional uh, pivot point than anything that has to do with the speed of light. The speed of light actually lives more in here. So let's rearrange this. And if we have this power and this power, then how do those two powers relate to each other? So in prior uh, parts of this, to show that this power is basically, that's what's stored in the line. That's what lights the light bulb before the generator sees it. And this is what the generator does. So there's a relationship between time and space. And then this, of course, keeps going on and on. And, and I, I can't get into all that here. But um, the, the end result is what we're after is what's called the propagation constant. And what that basically tells us is, is what part, what fraction of a cycle whether it be 60 or 60,000 or whatever, or 40 or whatever, but whatever percentage of that cycle, like half or a third or whatever, is transpired per centimeter distance down the transmission line. So that way you know how long it takes your signal to get from one end of the line to the other. That's a very important thing to know in transmission engineering. So like I say, this could keep going on and on, but I'm just kind of giving a little introduction here of, of what it is that I'm writing on now. And I think there's one other thing I might assemble here on the desk while we're here and all that. So we'll have to take a break for that and I'll set it up. So we have a situation here where we're going to study this long distance DC transmission line. And we're going to reduce the uh, the amps and volts and what have you to smaller values for convenience for the decimal point. So instead of a million volts, we'll say a thousand volts. And instead of 2,000 amps, we'll say two amps. So it's kind of like an analog computer. And the length is 750 miles. So now what's going to happen here is we are going to short circuit the line at the end and then let the electromagnetic wave come and trip the circuit breakers and abruptly disconnect the line from a constant current source in this case of two amps let's say. So what goes on in that line? So this is what I'm attempting to map out here. So I haven't, I haven't dealt with these in quite some time, so I might have a little bit of a difficulty getting it exactly down, but this is the voltage wave, and this is the current wave. So now the current has been, of the, the short circuit has been interrupted at this point, so it drops to zero amps. Uh, the electrostatic potential between the wires is zero because it was a short circuit, but now that the short circuit is opened, then full voltage appears at the end of the line. Well, where did that voltage come from if it's on the load side of the circuit breaker? Well, it came from the discharge of the current, which can no longer exist. So the energies have flipped. And actually, there was no real energy until this process started. And the energy is localized to this, because in this condition, there is no energy, and in this condition, there's no energy. Only in this electromagnetic slab does that condition exist. So now we've allowed it to reflect off the end of the line, 
and because the end of the line is short circuited there can't be any voltage so it goes away but its energy has to go somewhere so now that becomes a current but that current now is upside down because there's a um, short circuit at the end of the line and so it's reflecting off of that and then this just keeps going back and forth and back and forth and somewhere here I see I'm doing a little extra work on this with the is that page five yeah so what I'm trying to do here now is get into the no okay I see it's still got continuity all the way through so are these sequential or is yeah, it supposed sequential. to represent one? Well, this is, this is, the, okay, this, so is the, this, this happens, is the first, then this. this is the first. Okay. Like I say, I, I'm not even, you know, yeah. I haven't looked at this in months. So, okay, yeah, so this is, the breaker opens. Okay, here's the electromagnetic slab. And what this is doing as it travels down the line, it's taking the so-called potential energy, in this case, of... Yeah, because it's going to take in the potential energy out of the dielectric field and transferring it into the potential energy of the magnetic field, which is the ampers, and that process is taking place in that slab. So now, the challenge here is, as I've been advancing this into more and more complicated situations, is to follow the continuity of energy through all of the multiple reflections which uh, turned out to be a lot more complicated than I thought it would. So, so a lot of this stuff here is still kind of primordial. And it's this point, I'm trying to figure out the reflections. Yeah, okay, so, so now I'm trying to figure out why the two amps reversed at the short circuit. See, it's up down. I've got to go back to all this. This is what I'm, I'm coming up to. Mm -hmm. Again, this, these presentations, when I do these big presentations, what happens is, is they get in the middle of one of these projects, and then i got to make sure that everything's completely organized, because after being away from it for four or five months. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you can see the part I'm after here, mm -hmm. is the exchange of energy and making it all balance out. And the complication has been with the reflection coefficients. They don't really work out the way they're supposed to. So if you look at this whole process in time, what you have, this being like an oscilloscope, and let's say we have this connected to uh, the sending end of the line would be this one, then, uh, <clears throat> then what you would see on the oscilloscope is because the energy can't get out of the line because the breaker's opened and the other end short circuit, it can't get out. So what it does, it just constantly flops back and forth and back and forth, and the current and the voltage stay out of phase in such a manner that, that never at one time do you have voltage and current together, so you can never have any electric power, which cannot result in any electric energy, and you can't have any real electromagnetism in the system because there's no... Uh, uh, magnetism and dielectricity existing at the same space at the same time so it just endlessly bounces back and forth and back and forth and produces this rectangular waveform so when you when the breaker trips on a long distance transmission line the line is not dead it's ringing like a bell in this case I think it's like 1000 cycles a second or something for that particular line and the, what happens is, is the crackling, you know, and the corona on the insulators and wires, and then the resistance eats it up, and it's usually gone within a second. But it has a powerful blast to it. So this is the reason for getting into the mathematics, is to be able to get into a detailed analysis of exactly what are all the energy relationships in these, these traveling and standing waves in a manner that does not seem to be covered in any of the textbooks where it's all based on the law of conservation or continuity of energy and not voltage and current and the ways that it's normally dealt with so it's been quite a challenge this is the first time I've actually had to try and ask for help from other people um, after just a simple algebraic relationship but it doesn't seem to be easy to arrive at so I think that pretty much um, you got a good idea what I'm going to be involved with here for the next 
year maybe. So one notebook is done. And I think this one will be about three. And then as you can see, there's loads and loads of these reflection diagrams. And we um, kept the camera over there. So this is the one, this is the one that you have now. So this is the one that can go on the website. So this is the writings for all this. For electromagnetic yeah, condition? Up, yeah, up to um, and including chapter three. So right now, what you saw me with the desk here when you first started, that's the beginning of chapter four. And then the the images on the internet, this is the, the log of them. There we go. This is what's on the internet now. So the objective is to get everything written up through chapter five. And then chapter six starts with this traveling and standing wave thing and that's still in the experimental stage, but it's near completion. At any rate, one thing I did want to show, this is the completed heavy side equation for electric power. So I'd like to put this in an envelope and send it in a time tunnel back to Heaviside. <laughs> so it's all based on, uh, there's no volts and amps anymore. We're dealing with the fluxes directly. There's no um, E fields or H fields or volts or amps. All those things are mathematical abstractions. This deals directly with the fluxes. And then it, the, the resultant or, you know, the dimension of the whole thing is in watts, basically. So it's directly applicable, as Steinmetz points out, that its power is the fundamental uh, factor or quantity in electrical engineering, as electrical engineers deal with power. Not energy, but power. And energy actually turns out to be, the energy terms in this equation appear in the, uh, the conflicts between the two fields, the imbalance in the system, and uh, and otherwise, in the, in the main part, which is the this is the energy coming out of the generator. Well, it's not energy anymore here; it's power. It's very important. Energy is is really not part of what's going on. It's it's either power or it's the uh, the other side of energy, which they call uh, what do they call it? Uh, energy time, or I call it the Planck. And Steinmetz says that basically is the uh, is the is to paraphrase him, it would be the molecule of electricity, and and power is is that divided by time squared, which works out very conveniently to be the product of the inductance and capacitance and so on and so on, which is you know what this is all about is to show how all that works, and how it can uh, you know be turned into engineering reality. So in this case, the imbalance terms are what push on the wires. And push them apart or pull them together or actually can rip them right off the cross arms. And no one really has provided engineers to date with any um, basic algebraic relationship to compute that. So what I did is, is then I took these factors out of the heavy side equation and applied them to a paper that Steinmetz wrote. And then I came up with some very simple algebraic relationships for the force that pushes or pulls the wires together if you know you know what the voltage between them is or what the current in them is and you can calculate these forces on the wires where I have yet to find a textbook that would give you this relationship but it showed up in some very obscure Steinmetz paper and so I used all of the uh, the factors that I've developed in the previous chapters here to apply it and simplify his formula even further. So basically when there's energy being uh, stored, if there's energy in the line, then that energy exerts forces on the line trying to get out. It's basically that simple. 
If it's purely electromagnetic, at that point the energy is all in the electromagnetism and there's no more of it on the wires. And you could have one billion watts flowing through that transmission line and those conductors will not feel a thing as long as it's purely electromagnetic. But there's factors that unbalance it one way or another and it was Heaviside's claim to fame as he was the one that discovered this particular relationship and how to make the two forces neutral and eliminate the distortion and that gave us uh, long distance telephony and uh, power transmission and all of that is what grew out of it. So I think I'll close it at that point.